Hi, I'm Othias, and this little guy, this is the Portuguese Revolver 9.1mm model of 1886, an actual honest Abadie. Let's get in the light box. Now the 86 is the big boy Abadie, so it has an overall length of 10 and 1 quarter inch and weighs in just shy of 2 pounds. The cylinder takes six rounds of 9.1 by 17 millimeter rimmed, a cartridge that is dedicated specifically to this gun. It loads through a right hand loading gate that actually has a very interesting mechanism in it, which is really the core of what we're talking about today. Just a reminder, this show is almost entirely a product of our patrons because we do not monetize well on YouTube and we do not have an ongoing sponsorship of any kind. This is a donor funded program, or you can visit our shop and pick up some product to show your love. Now, for those of you who have paid close attention to our show, you're probably thinking the Abity. For those of you who are confused, there are actually a fair few handguns who borrow from this particular design. However, this is the original Abity and has only been loosely documented actually. Much of its history is still a bit shrouded. Uh, therefore, this is gonna be another one of those here's what we know for now episodes. So we're gonna get the story started in Portugal. Little Spoon to Spain's Big Spoon Portugal had sat atop a worldwide empire, but by 1860 or so, this was largely limited to Africa. Like we see with other shrinking empires, Portuguese armament was generally directed more towards naval and colonial units, uh, with the home army seeing less proactive investment in new technology. So about the time other nations really got into early revolver technology, the Portuguese officials were not particularly impressed. So much so that in 1867, along with adopting the Wesley Richards rifle, they would also start using a single shot breech loading pistol of the same make. In the Portuguese army mindset of the time, revolvers were complicated, delicate, and especially expensive. And it was simply a waste to buy them as all you would do is give them to officers. And those guys shouldn't actually be fighting. They should be leading the fight. Uh, this same notion did not necessarily extend to the Navy, which had already been making use of Colt percussion revolvers and in 1863 had adopted the Beaumont Adams. Again, a percussion gun, but still plenty modern for the time. Now, I doubt the Navy's forward thinking had much influence on the Army, but their own officers probably did, because by the time we reach 1870, many Army officers are carrying privately purchased Leffa Show pinfire revolvers. While the pinfire system would turn out historically to be a bit of a technological stopgap, it did introduce a lot of countries to repeating fire metallic cartridge handguns. Eventually, the benefits became unignorable, and we'll start to see the first Continental revolvers being adopted. The movement seems to have started in the Municipal Guards Cavalry, particularly in Lisbon and Porto, who in 1871 adopted the Galand Somerville. This was an adaptation of the 1868 Galand revolver modified by Alfred Somerville. It chambered a 45 caliber center fire cartridge and extracted all of its empties at once by working a lever under the barrel. About this same time, the army would finally take up the revolver question more seriously, forming a commission which was headed by Francisco Xavier Lopez, Inspector of Artillery Material. Combing for modern revolvers, several designs would stand out. The Austrian Gasser of 1870, the Shamlo Delvin and several derivatives thereof, the Smith & Wesson No. 3 Russian, and the Adams which was now modified for center fire. That last one would actually be adopted by the Portuguese Navy in 1874. Now most of the revolvers I just mentioned were single and double action models, but strangely, the only single action was also the only one with a rapid ejector. Or maybe it's not that strange. Uh, don't forget, Portugal was new to revolvers, and there were disagreements about what features were most important. By just one example, uh, a Colonel uh, Cuja Salgado went on record in 1877, and in his own opinion, the Portuguese army needed a revolver for officers and for the cavalry, which we often see as the first concerns of a nation adopting repeating handguns. But his feature list is both interesting and somewhat telling of the confusion in the era. Salgado wanted six shots with metallic centerfire cartridges. Seems reasonable. He also believed simultaneous ejection was critically important because of the aid in speeding up reloading the gun in combat. Also reasonable. Finally, the revolver should be single action only. Double actions were frankly only dangerous to the person carrying them. 
Yep, I'm fairly sure he just wanted to sell the number three Smith & Wesson with that description, and whether or not he was sincerely worried about potential accidents, or frankly just chilling, uh, these were the debates that were going on. On the other side of the coin, there was a lot of pushback against rapid ejection and loading actions, and while in the modern context that seems backwards, it kind of makes sense given what was available at the time. The two rapid eject systems that we know were known to Portugal in any detail were the aforementioned Smith & Wesson number 3, which has a tendency to be damaged with rough and repeated handling. I know a lot of you will boo this, but top brakes fundamentally walk out of time faster than solid frames, all factors equal. There are vulnerabilities to the top brake system. The other rapid unloading pistol was the Glon Somerville, which was again already in use with municipal guards. Now, I do not have a Galan Somerville, but I do have a Galan 1868, which has a different internal lock work, but pretty much the exact same extraction method. So let's see exactly what the problem was. All right, one day I really want to actually fire this gun, but that's going to take a lot of work to make its very unique cartridge. But uh, Portugal already had a version of this firearm internally different. Uh, it didn't have this guy all the way wrapped around. Instead, there was a knob up here. And let me show you the critical advantages slash major disadvantage, right? The big advantage, of course, is simultaneous ejection. So, boom, all your cartridges come out. You can easily load up the new cartridges and then slam that guy shut and you're ready to go. If I open it up, we'll see what the disadvantage is, which is that in this particular instance, the entire front half of this gun is connected to the rear half by one singular threaded rod at this point, the central spindle. That's going to wear out fairly quickly with hard military use. Probably not an ideal revolver for a rugged empire. All right, so if neither this nor the Smith & Wesson is going to be acceptable, what is going to work? Well, of course, it's going to have to be a solid frame revolver. metal all the way around the action. But since we're not yet in the era of swing out cylinders, how the heck are you gonna speed up the loading and unloading process? Well, that problem was neatly solved by one Isaac Ismael Abadie. Probably. You see, I'm about to tell you the story of a man who I'm pretty sure is our Abadie. Like all episodes, I'm dependent on previous researchers, and at least one has claimed another man, a, a Georges Abadie, was responsible for our gun today. However, it is my sincere belief that, drawn from the data I currently have, Isaac Ismael Abadie is our Abadie. So let's talk about him. Born January 20th of 1820 in Viozon, France, son of Joseph Romain and Catherine Sabaté. Abadie. We know little of his early life, except that he did become an inventor, patenting a collapsible umbrella in 1850, and apparently some form of new cigarette paper years later. This we know because in 1867 he started a company for the sale of said paper. Abadie's life would be changed by the Franco-Prussian War, although not directly by battle, but from the social clash afterwards. German victory meant French humiliation, and a sort of civil war brewed. Well, more of a one-city autonomous zone, the Paris Commune, formed when soldiers of the National Guard would not accept the French Third Republic. While the Commune had control of Paris, the decision was made to remove something they considered to be a historical and cultural eyesore, the Vendôme Column. Erected by Napoleon in honor of the victory at Austerlitz, this column was now seen as a celebration of war and largely loathed within the artists of the Commune. So they tore it down. Well, technically, they ordered it torn down. Engineer Abadie was among the men contracted for the demolition, which would have been just another paying gig if not for the fact that the French army soon retook Paris in what was known as the Bloody Week. The Third Republic government wasn't too happy to find the column absent, so everyone involved was routed up for trial. Abadie chose to flee to Brussels and then on into Liège. Belgium, of course. This was probably a wise idea, as he was convicted in absentia in September of 1872. Now, of course, once an inventor is in Liège, we know he's going to work on revolvers. That's just a given. What he developed would be a safe means of more rapidly loading and unloading a solid frame gate-accessed revolver. 
I'll show you how in just a bit. His patent rights were sold to one Gustave Prevost, a Belgian gunmaker, who in turn sold out both Abadie's and his own patent rights, which included a neat side plate cover, more on that little feature in just a moment as well, to another Liège gunsmith. Leonard Soleil. Born in October 16th, 1829 in Liège, Leonard was the son of a gunsmith and apparently carried on the family tradition. And that's about all I know from his early history. Liège gunsmiths are the Gordian knot of revolver history. For anybody who is a would-be researcher in this field, this is a very great undiscovered country. Unfortunately, you will probably have to physically be in Belgium to get a lot of this done. Anyway, uh, Leonard Salales produces a pistol with the uh, Abadie and Prevost patents and sends it along to Portugal for testing, which is another area where we actually have a gap in the data because I don't particularly have any trials notes. Heck, I'm not sure who even paired it with the 9.1 millimeter round, a cartridge roughly comparable to 38 Smith & Wesson in terms of power. Apparently chosen as it provided a point blank range of 39 and one half meters, which for some reason was called for. Honestly, all we know for sure from the trials is that the Abadie one, although not quite this one, it was adopted as the revolver 9.1 millimeter model of 1878, which as you can see, definitely not the model I have here today, but very close. Uh, the internals are dang near identical. So let me show you the critical features on this particular guy. All right, ignore the entirety of the gun. We only care about this and we're not even all the way there yet, but I wanna show you two very critical features. Number one, coming from the uh, Prevost portion of this, at least I assume from the Prevost portion of this, we have a removable side plate. And on the Abadie gun, not the Abadie system, you pull to the rear of this trigger guard, which is a little tight. Let's see. Oh, pop. And then swing it down. Now, I want you to pay close attention to this. As I swing that down, actually, let me see if I can get it into the front camera. As I swing it down, right here, it's going to cam and pop the plate. See that? It's popping the plate upwards all on its own. Let me see, there we go. That's probably a better angle. Pop, yeah. That, having dealt with a lot of old Smith & Wessons and Colts, that's beautiful. The gun opens its own side plate. No, you know, banging around with a little plastic hammer trying to get it to fall out. And if it's greased in there or rusted, nope, pops right out. So once it lifts that edge for you, you just finish the swing. And it doesn't actually have a hinge, but it does have a little half hinge where it wants to rotate off that point. Now, there's a lot going on in this action. I don't want to show you every little detail yet, but I do want to show you specifically how our Abadie gate works. So if I flip this around, what you'll see is that if we pull this gate open to load the gun, once it's open, pulling the trigger no longer moves the hammer. See it's sitting perfectly still, and it's a little out of engagement because I'm playing with it. Okay, so what I can do now is I can load six rounds, one, two, three, four, five, six, load them all in. If I fired them all, I can use my ejector and eject one, eject two, eject three, you get the idea, all right? The way it accomplishes that is by having a simple tooth that's engaged on the hammer. Let me go ahead and zoom in a little bit so you can see that. All right, without going into detail on the action, what we need to know is that when you pull the trigger, this little projection hits this nose and cocks the hammer, right? So if you can get this nose out of the way, well, then the hammer won't move, all right? In order to do that, it's kind of hidden behind the hand right here, but you'll see it when I turn this guy. So let me see if I can do this as flat as possible. See it turning in there, turning, click. We have now compressed the nose so that when we pull the trigger, the hand rises, but it does not connect with the nose. And so we can index the revolver and never work the hammer. That basically is the Abadie in the Abadie. That is the thing that is uniquely what the whole gun is named for, is that functionality. The rest of this is an evolution of other systems. Now, I think it's quite apparent that there was some cavalry consideration in adopting the Abadie action. It's a lot like what we saw with the later French 1892 revolver. Take the gun in the left hand, where you could also keep your reins and load with the right. And from snippets of letters and period talk, it appears there was supposed to be an order of these guns, well not these guns, the 78, for the men on horseback. Uh, they may have even wanted them to be scaled up somewhat, 
but apparently that decision fell to the wayside for at least a few years. Instead, the Model 78 was for officers only, and it was up to them to pay the bill out of their own salaries. The cost was 11,000 real, and apparently a customs duty to boot. I'm unsure of the specific numbers for purchases of the 1878, but they were likely very low, as the gun remains very rare today. Within two years of issue, a number of concerns cropped up, one of which was some worry about not having essentially a manual safety of sorts. Because with a double action revolver, you could, in theory, draw and shoot yourself in the leg on the draw. So the point of this concern is that this is sitting in our holster, and then we go to draw from our holster, and we have bad trigger discipline. So when we yank it from our holster, we pull by the trigger like a not very smart person. And then we somehow overcome how heavy this trigger can be. It's, it's fairly light, but you know, maybe, no, nah, I don't see how, but you overcome, it gets real stuck and, and you pull real hard and then boom, you shoot yourself in your leg, right? That's the fear. Well, because of the Abity gate system, we have an inbuilt safety. You can just carry it with the gate loaded and there's no chance of you discharging the gun into your own leg. However, this creates an additional potential problem in that now uh, the front of our, eject or our uh, port is open, our, our loading gate. And so we could have rounds just fall out of the gun. So we don't want that by accident. What could we do? Well, the proposed solution was to split this guy in half so that two versions of it could be folded forward and to have a slight overhang between them. So that way you'd be able to grab here, pull open, and it would open both and everything would be like you want it. But if you wanted to put the gun into safe, well, into, I don't want my rounds to fall out, but still in a manual safety position, you could grab the outside of it, let's say, and push just that forward. And then you'd have the one arm forward, which keep your round in, and the one arm back, which would mean you were on safe. And then when you were ready to fire, you could then push the other one forward. And that was proposed. It was obviously not accepted because we don't know of any guns with those features now. A second concern was soon voiced, and this is when I need to say, it was not uncommon for competitor companies to try and sell their already made improvements by sponsoring officer concerns, because a design was submitted by another Belgian firm, uh, Simonis Jensen and uh, Dumoulin, which featured a Jean Warnant style rebounding hammer. Um, let me show you. All right, I've gone ahead and opened this guy up and zoomed in because we already saw how to get in there and I just pulled off the trigger guard for a second. Once we're into the action, this should look very familiar to you if you're a fan of the show because it is dead on the Nagant 1878. Uh, other than the fact that this is a V spring and the other one's a big S spring, we've got this sort of sear here, main spring. Uh, this has a stirrup on like the Abity nose, hand with the rear spring. It's very, very similar minus like j j just a couple little details, right? Let's get this guy over here. Yeah, we're missing that front trigger spring and instead we're getting our attention elsewhere. We're gonna see it better in the animation. You get the idea, right? Well, neither one of these systems has a automatic rebound and an automatic rebound would be we pull the trigger and then the hammer falls. I'm sorry, we're gonna get a little blurry. The hammer falls and then when we let go, it would go Boop automatically, like that. This one didn't do that. As a matter of fact, if I were to pull the trigger on this guy, uh, sorry, a bit hard to do while it's in the camera frame. Boom, and, oh my God, there we go, fire. Boom, look at that, that thing's flush, okay? If that's flush, that means it's down on a primer. If the gun were loaded, it would have gone bang, that's ideal, and it would be on a dead primer. If we want to index to the next round, we either have to pull the trigger, which will rebound this manually, or we have to cock it, which we're rebounding it manually. No problem there. The big risk on some of this stuff is that you throw another round in, let's say, and then index the cylinder over manually or some crazy thing and you drag across a primer. Whatever the case may be, there's a fear of having a hammer resting on a live round, okay? However, because of the way the system is sealed, let's say, that is almost impossible to make happen without practically breaking the gun because when this hammer is down like this, the slightest pull of the trigger, ever so slight, and it bounces it right back into a manually locked rebound. As a matter of fact, 
that's practically a hammer stop. You you would have to you would have to blow this hard enough to deform to get past this. This is a good hammer block, right? If you had fired it and then didn't index the trigger, but instead started rotating the cylinder, which you really can't because the firing pin's dragging, but maybe you're just a gorilla about it. I don't know. I don't know where these fears are coming from because to load the gun, to, to mess with changing up the ammo in the gun, you would have to open this gate and to open the gate also, oh, look at that. It manually rebounded the hammer into that, you know, safe position, which is up off the cylinder, up off any cartridges or primers in there. And also technically hammer blocked, can't push it forward. So this is actually already a thoughtful system, more so even than the Nagant, because it's going to, no matter what, be indexed to the rebounded position. No need to have a rebound. All right, we're in a weird spot because I'm showing you how the 1878 revolver I don't have works with an 1886 revolver that I do have here, and yet we don't know why this exists yet. Uh, however, I'll cheat the ending a bit and tell you that there are no major mechanical difference, which means we can take a closer look with an animation. Before we load this revolver, let's get a look at the loading gate. These are usually just meant to keep the ammunition in place, but the Abadie patent includes a protruding half-circle lug. Opening the gate causes this lug to turn into the nose, compressing it against the hammer, which in turn is pressed rearward enough to engage its rebounded position. Now, we can load the revolver simply by placing in each round and then pulling the trigger to advance the cylinder for the next. With the nose compressed and the hammer held back, this gun cannot be fired. Closing the gate releases the nose, but the hammer remains on the first sear notch. The sear, by the way, is powered by its own long flat spring. This position is not what we think of as a safety halfcock, as the trigger is not locked. This is more of a manually rebounded position. For single action, we can simply pull the hammer all the way back. At this point, the sear engages all the way at the rear. Pulling the trigger will tip it into releasing the hammer with minimal resisting spring force. For double action, we just pull the trigger, which has a rear extension that presses on the nose, tilting the hammer back and eventually slipping off to release it. Just to be clear, this is that nose, which is powered by its own internal flat spring, allowing it to be engaged by the trigger during an upward stroke, but bypassed on the return. Attached to the trigger is the hand, which is biased forwards by its own flat spring in order to stay engaged with the teeth on the back of the cylinder. Pulling the trigger raises the hand, which spins the cylinder, and releasing the trigger allows the hand to bounce back down the serrated teeth. The mainspring powering the hammer is fairly light, but also very long. Unlike many revolvers, it does not use a stirrup and makes contact directly with the hammer. This two-pronged flat spring at the rear is responsible for pushing the trigger forward thanks to a stud on its right. It also serves to bias the loading gate into one of two positions thanks to notches cut in its cylinder. Once empty, we again open the gate which disengages the hammer. And from here, we can manually manipulate the ejector rod between pulls of the trigger to get all six spent cases out. Okay, back to Othias. Okay, so just to recap, an exiled Frenchman sold his patent to a Belgian who sold both that and his own patent to another Belgian who may or may not have sold them to his son. That's a separate issue. But uh, either of them then sold the resulting revolver 1878 to the Portuguese who internally had several questions about making changes which were ultimately all put to rest without modification. While all that was going on, the NCOs and uh, non-officer cavalry were itching for their own modern revolver. In 1885, General Cordero would uh, begin actively probing for why the Municipal Guard's horsemen had centerfire revolvers, but the Army's own cavalry did not. This began a trials process to correct the issue. And while the Abadie 1878 had been satisfactory, there was some concern about range and power. The 9.1 millimeter cartridge was acceptable for officer work, but as a duty cartridge, they wanted to get the most from it. In 1881, the cartridge was bulked up to better engage the rifling and squeeze a bit more muzzle velocity. I'm actually unsure of the results of these efforts. There would also be a model 1883 cartridge. And again, I'm at a loss for what was actually changed. Whatever they tried with the cartridges, I'm sure very little was accomplished in terms of performance because when they adopted the new revolver, the Portuguese army officials opted for a longer barrel. 
The new model 1886 sported a 14 centimeter barrel, whereas the 1878 only had 11. This means a whole extra 17 meters per second of muzzle velocity. Not astounding, but at least you are going to get a little bit more sight radius in the deal. And that is the handgun I have here today, so we can finally get an overall tour. All right, this episode is all sorts of backwards because I've been trying to talk about a gun that I don't have here today that shares internals with this one, so we use this as a stand-in. But now we get to look at the actual 1886, which differentiates itself from the early 78 by having a longer barrel, a slightly different ejector rod setup, and then really there's a takedown difference that I'll explain in a moment. So let's take a look for just a second. Long barrel, well, you guys can see that for yourselves. And on the ejector, it actually has this swing over oops, horseshoe looking deal that's very similar to what we saw on the Rostin Gosser 1898, which is a gun I believe was inspired by this one. Now we'll open up our gate. And of course the Abity system means we can pull our trigger, we can eject, and then you'll notice this channel. This is actually new to the later 86 as well. Uh, and it's prone to fouling. This ejector system, honestly, is probably the weakest part of the whole thing, as the earlier one would have been a Shemlo Delvin style big old cap and sealed up action, and it just seems a, a lot, it seems a lot stronger than this one. This one's a little worrisome to me, but I haven't seen any snapped off, so maybe I'm crazy. Now, I did not close this all the way up after our last assembly. Oh, there we go. Uh, we've already seen that takedown there, so let's talk about, uh, markings for just a second. On the left side of the frame, you'll see System Abadie Brevet. And then at the front, we're gonna see a crown over FA. This can actually be oriented in several different ways. All they are are the Portuguese acceptance marks. On the other side, we will actually see the manufacturer's mark, El Solil of Liege, the only man to produce the Abadie for Portugal. Now, like I said, I've done, you know, the main takedown bits of pulling this to the rear, flipping it open. That was super cool. Uh, let me get this out of the way for a second. I'm gonna go ahead and talk to you about removing the cylinder because everybody loves to see a naked gun. I'll flip this guy over and you'll see we have a latch here. We press that down and pull. And then we're in. This is not unlike the Naga all over again. A gun that came out in the same year and has a lot of similar, man, the Belgians just really ripped each other off a lot. All right, with that, we can get into our cylinders, six shots. There's actually, Nothing super fancy going on here. I'll set these aside for a second. I will say, if this had been a 78, we would have seen another difference here, which is that as I understand it, I have not handled one, the left grip panel was retained by the side plate. And so you would be able to lift this grip panel away. And what you would find underneath is actually fairly interesting. On the 1878, you can see this odd tooth here that's actually the head of an internal rod, which is used to tighten the right side grip screw. Ridiculously complicated, but guaranteed not to loosen. Now, when they went to the 1886 model, that particular tool was dropped in favor of just a regular external screw on the right-hand grip. However, you can see that the central spindle that we removed earlier in our uh, disassembly has a screwdriver tip for this exact purpose. All right, I think you guys have got the idea here, so let's get it over to May for a demonstration.
This thing feels thoroughly modern. Anyway, uh, El Salil would remain the only manufacturer of the Portuguese service Abadie revolvers. Uh, the first model 1886s started arriving in Portugal in 1887 and shipments continued until at least 1892. For both patterns, there's roughly 12,000 in total, which may seem like a small number, but by the time of these revolvers, Portuguese colonial, naval, and army added together were not as big as the usual European standing army. Ammunition was initially acquired from Belgium, produced by Victor Francot, May, and company. Domestic production at the uh, Officina Pyrotechnica started by at least 1881 and seems to have halted in 1888. Fabrica de Armas uh, Lisbon apparently picked up from there until 1910 or so. And finally, in 1891, yet another cartridge change was made. Again, the details are a bit hazy, though I do know this one had two lubrication grooves instead of one, and apparently managed 183 meters per second. The revolver and ammunition were issued with a holster, lanyard, and 20 round cartridge box, though the cavalry got pouches on a bandolier when applicable. Arriving in 1887, the new model was first fielded to, of course, the cavalry, and this is where I'm happy to say I finally solved a mystery that has bothered me for quite a while. Back in our Portuguese Kropatchik episode, I mentioned that the original carvings were quickly taken from the cavalry and converted into artillery models with bayonets. We also saw their replacement with another carbine, the Monlicker 1896, and if you're paying attention, that left a five-year gap more likely six to allow for delivery. And at the time, I wondered what the heck were they doing without carbines for five or six years? Well, it turns out they were issued the Abadie to replace the original Kropatscheks. This proved obviously unsatisfactory in the long term, and so the Monlicker was then adopted to replace the Abadie, and soon this thing, because of the extras now available, would be extended to other forces like the Fiscal Guard, uh, the Portuguese Customs and Border Guard, and the Artillery Troops uh, and Military Administration. Uh, the Municipal... I can't speak. The Municipal Guard's Cavalry would also eventually trade in their Galan Somervilles for the Abadie 1886. The Portuguese Navy would also adopt the latter Abadie, fielding them fairly widely to sergeants, quartermasters, buglers, foremen, machinist assistants, carpenters, nurses, and ambulance crew, plus some others. You get an Abadie, and you get an Abadie, and you get an Abadie. And when the cavalry pistols were freed again, thanks to the Monlicker 1896, the Abadie would trickle further on down. By 1901, it was being issued to army sergeants, buglers, and other assorted specialty troops just like the Navy had done. Now, service life for these little guys would be fairly limited. They were mostly used in various minor conflicts in the administration of the remaining Portuguese colonial holdings. Mostly, it appears in Mozambique. It's worth noting we're aware of them being in the hands of at least two notable individuals in history. Yao de Azevedo Cortinho, who likely had one when he was in battle during an African pacification campaign at age 25. Cotinho would go on to be a military administrator, politician, and honorary rear admiral. Anabody was also in the hands of Roberto Ivans, noted naval officer, explorer, geographer, and colonial administrator. Now, I haven't been able to find any direct complaints against the Abadie in service, but I haven't found much praise either. Being a six-shot revolver, reliable, but only somewhat faster than your average gate loader, doesn't really make it stand out, I suppose. And over time, it would be replaced with more advanced options. The Army would adopt the 30 caliber Luger in 1908, and the Navy took up a 9mm version in 1910. These should have been the end of the Abadie, but in small ways, it soldiered on. Of course, it took time to fall out of standard service, and even so, it found a home with municipal police, in addition to remaining with the guards units. However, uh, even as a secondary arm, it was further pressured out during World War I. That's because the Portuguese also purchased the Savage 1907, same as the French, though with their own unique grip plates. Unlike other participants in the war, Portugal wasn't put under quite the same arms pressure. The Vaguero, the Kropatschek, and the Lugers were the primary arms in Africa. It's likely some Abadie were still on hand, but to my knowledge, ammunition stopped in 1910. In Europe, the Portuguese Expeditionary Force used arms provided by the British in particular, allowing them to integrate into the front line. So, no Portuguese guns there. However, 
Officers could carry their own sidearms, and it seems at least a few still had a fondness for the old Abadie instead of the new Luger 32s. Even so, by 1917, this revolver had no mention in the manual of regulatory war material. So not a major contributor to the war. I'm sorry, gang. But it did serve on in the municipal guards until around the mid-30s. The fiscal guard carried it on for at least another two decades. Uh, as a matter of fact, it could have been a lot longer because there were new holsters being made for this gun with dates as late as 1951. Abadies were also apparently still on hand during the annexation of Goa in 1961, where it was still distributed as a personal defense firearm to non-combatant officers. These likely survived so long because instead of being hauled in when replaced in the colonies, the Abadie tended to stay put in storage wherever it was, or it was issued out to civilian administrators. In that capacity, it's likely they made it in some very remote territories into the 1970s, so nearly a hundred years of service. The largest pocket of supply for the post-service collector's market came from a 1990s disposition of surplus arms. Apparently, a fair few went through a German gunsmith, uh, Franconia Waffen in Wurzburg, and were converted into using a bizarre compressed air 5.5mm cartridge, apparently a sort of gallery load. Returning to good old Leonard Solil, in 1889 he turned his business over to his son, Leon Solil. This was likely due to illness as he'd pass away in December of 1890. Leon would take on the mantle and apparently had his trademarks running until at least 1897. At some point it appears SJD, that's Simona Sjansen and Dumoulin, uh, the ones that recommended a modified version of this gun. Well, they acquired the rights to actually produce the Abity. I'm unsure if this was a license or a buyout of the patent or what. I've also seen, I've seen claims that they straight up bought El Salil, but that doesn't seem to fit with other things I've seen. Anyway, SJD would sell their own modified version under the name Excelsior into the 1890s. And I'd like to point out the Excelsior has a lot in common with the later uh, Austrian Rostengasser. Returning to our primary inventor, Isaac Abadie, uh, he was pardoned in May of 1879 and would return to Paris, though I'm unsure exactly when. What we do know is that he would die there in February of 1885. Alright, hopefully I've taken what was a very obscure little revolver and brought some of its history to light. Again, this is a fairly loosely stacked episode. I tried to read everything I could lay hands on, but there isn't really a whole lot out there and not a lot of it's been sort of peer-reviewed. Uh, I dug pretty deep for this guy, but hopefully more will turn up on him in the future now that more people are interested. Regardless, I'd like to point out how influential this gun was. The Abadi Gate appears on the Swiss 1882, Italian 1889 Bodeo, and the Austrian Rost and Gosser 1898, and I'm sure we'll continue to find it elsewhere in the commercial markets. It's also taken me quite a few years to find this gun. Uh, I really wanted to show one for the show because of its influence, and yet they're very, very uncommon in the American market. They're actually not that rare at all in Europe. But thank you, Michael, for lending this to us. I promise to send it home safe and sound. But before that, let's get May's opinion on shooting the Abadie 1886. Once more, we've made room for May, and we have plenty of room for this very beautiful revolver. But I guess I'm taking your job, aren't I? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm the one with the hair and the face. That's your defining characteristic. Yeah. The hair and the f okay. I have hair. <laughs> face. It's, no, I have hair wait, on you my have face. hair? I have hair on my face. Yeah, but you have hair under that hat. This is the hand trap series has been going. Everybody's learned my secret. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's under a, it's hat hair right. Now. Okay, now that's just. Anyway, are we gonna talk about the thing? Probably. Um. We have the Portuguese Abadie, 1886, not the 78, which we were not able to get a hold of, but has the same internal mechanism and general profile, but not the long barrel. Right. Um, so if you'll excuse a couple centimeters, I think we understand the Abadie pretty well. Now, I'd like to think we do. <laughs> so, uh, May, give us your impressions um, just on the face of it. What's it like to sort of look at and initially get your hands on an Abadie 1886? Okay. Um, first impressions are, uh, of course, it's you, like whenever you hand it a plate, you know, people say like you you tend to eat with your eyes first. So that's why they really in, in food and bed try to make sure your plates look really nice. That's the thing is that the first thing I'm doing is I'm eating this with my eyes. And 
This looks go this looks gorgeous. It's very edible looking. I want to take a bite out of it. Okay, I feel like you might want to shoot it with your eyes yeah. instead of eating it yeah, with your shoot eyes. eyes. Yeah. Okay. But no, uh, looks wise, it looks beautiful. It really does. Like there's a lot of there's a lot of contours to this thing that just make it look really delicate, though. So I'm a little bit concerned on its if it will actually hold up over time, I suppose. Yeah, this gun gets compared a lot to the Shamlo Del D Shamlo Delvine. I can't speak. <laughs> but if you actually look at the Shamlo Delvine, like we have, that's a very boxy looking gun. It's not nearly as delicate or refined looking as this one. No, that one actually, if anything, is like more stout by comparison. I'm right. thinking more like this looks like a Rost and Gosser. Yeah, well, there's a key reason for that. I have a significant theory now that the uh, SJD gun that competed with this one mm -hmm. became the Rost and Gosser. I'm almost certain of it. Um, oh, okay. Just, That's kind of cool. Just from having seen one of them, sorry, I don't have the license to show you the image of the one that I've seen. Um, just from seeing one, though, the way the side gate opens or the way the side panel opens, mm -hmm. the contours and everything. It is so close to the Rost and Gosser, I can't help but believe that that was then used to make the Rost and Gosser a few years later. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, we're getting off into this right No, now. but yeah, it's basically like, it makes me think of like a Rost and Gosser and almost like a Type 26 had a baby. Yeah, especially when you get your hands on it. The grip yeah, feels the, a lot like the Japanese Type 26. That's kind of where I'm thinking of like getting into like more of the feature comparison. Like that's, that's that thinness right there. It, it's not expected i suppose it doesn't really feel like that's supposed to be a military revolver it doesn't feel like that's the appropriate one for a soldier to have is that weird no in a lot of ways the abbey is ahead of its time because when you get a hold of it uh it's a what i would call a small revolver mm -hmm. for military use oh yeah it, it looks incredibly small too in general right so once you wrap your hand around it you're like oh this is quite delicate feeling. yeah it's very thin it's very narrow and then on top of that it's got some like wonderful like swoop here, this kind of spur here in the back. That's a great placement for your hand. And then your pinky still being just ever so slightly moved forward like it should be. Yeah. And I have found even with my large mitts and her smaller ones, the, the contouring on this gun is very proactive about getting you into the proper grip. Mm -hmm. And it, what, how does it point? It actually points pretty well, pretty easily. It's right. like I, my hand is right where it needs to be. And unlike some other revolvers that I've shot, well, for next episode and previous ones, I didn't really have to adjust my grip any when it right. came you to just, shooting. Like boop. I just was able to point and shoot and continue on, which yeah, is pretty nice. It is probably one of the nicest pointing revolvers we've ever handled. Which now, is kind of crazy. Now, that think, being said, it's still pretty heavy. Like, I, I, yes. I'm not expecting that weight from this gun because I'm looking at all these contours. You're interrupting me. I'm sorry. It's almost two pounds. I just wanted to remind them yeah, of the objective. Yeah, it is almost two pounds. Like, that. that's crazy to me because I'm looking at this gun and I'm thinking, and I know this isn't going to be much of a difference, but I'm thinking like a pound and a half. But no, when you actually hold it, it's actually fairly muzzle heavy. And yet, this grip really does give you a solid, I guess, just angle on it that it really doesn't feel like it's that muzzle heavy, but it really truly is. It's it, got a lot of dot, uh, drop to it. It looks refined. It feels almost delicate in the hand mm -hmm. because it contours well, but the weight is quite authoritative. Yeah, it definitely has some punch power there to it. Now, again, to put this into context, 1878 for not quite this one. Mm -hmm. So a little bit lighter, but otherwise the same. Right. Uh, when we've looked at the guns we've shot in that same period, you're looking at Belgium adopting the 1878 Nagant, which oh, we've shot. right. Yeah, we have. That gun is the same size as the Shamlo Delvin 74, roughly. It's a, mm -hmm. you know, people are used to the Russian 1895 Nagant, so they think Nagant, size of this thing. Right. And if you think about but, how that look, how that looks in comparison to this one, that looks almost as delicate. Sort of, but they're still much more square cut. Yes. They're, they're, it's less, it's less refined looking. So in an era of... The Naga revolver or the mm -hmm. Shamlo Delvin revolver. Mm -hmm. This is the size of the later Russian Naga, the export Naga. Which is crazy. Right. So it's fairly advanced in that way. Um, although we'll talk more about the cartridge in a second because you've got yeah. to shoot the thing. So, um, we've, okay, we've assessed just looking at it. Yeah, we've assessed the grip. Um, the only other extra little features aside from like possibly getting into shooting it is just this loading and, well, this ejecting rod, sorry. Yeah. It is incredibly 
it, it looks really busy. Like there's a screw here on the bottom set with some sort of like push lever that I think is part of the disassembly. Right. So you'd flip over the ejecting rod. Right. Which is a then, hook. And then you got this hook sticking out. You'd press that weird button to take the gun apart. Mm -hmm. Or you'd eject with the ejecting rod. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I'm kind of have concerns about this ejector rod because it's just kind of hanging out there. I feel like this is something that's so thin that it could just easily snap off. Yeah, I don't. It's tensioned on its own accord to stay in its position. It doesn't really have that I've found any sort of system to force it to stay in position. Mm -hmm. So I can just see that thing coming loose and then you shove it in the holster or pull it out of the holster or something and it snags. I could just see that thing well, snapping. Well, it does, it, do, it does clip over. So there is like a, a slight Yeah, but it clips pop. over under itself, which means right. that horseshoe's doing the clamping, which to me says... But I, I wish we, I wish we could actually weigh it. But it doesn't really take, it doesn't take much force to pop this no. out either. It really doesn't. Like I, I can barely flex on my thumb a little bit. I think it's a miracle I haven't seen every one of these with that thing snapped off because mm -hmm. it, to me, it seems way delicate. And then actual using it like the ejector rod, this narrow little channel that it has to travel down, it like it even had like a little bit of a snag once or twice when I was trying to eject the rounds. So that was damage. Now, oh really? Okay. Yeah, we um we talked about this earlier in the episode, but essentially the 1878 did not have the cut channel. Okay. And it used a it really used a copy of the Shamlo Delvine's ejector rod, which was a cap, a big solid mushroom head style cap that rolled over. Okay. Versus this horseshoe. I have no idea why they went for this more delicate. So does the option. mushroom look to it kind of similar to the Nagant, the 78 Nagant? No, no, no. This would look just like a Shamlo Delvine. Just like, okay. With the with that big, almost hard, I don't know how hard it would be to clip off, because mm -hmm. on Shamlo Delvine, you've done this. You have to like, kunk to clip it off. Right. So it had a very stout system that was sealed. Okay. I don't know what happened. I have no notes. But they switched it for this very delicate system. Okay. Which then, actually, a similar delicate system ends up on the Rostin Gosser, which, again, is why I believe the Rostin Gosser is descended from this gun. Sure. Um, I, I honestly, I see it, especially just right here in that, just the bulk of it. Right. So, I don't know why they made this more delicate decision in addition to making the heavier barrel. It's very bizarre to me. Uh, it's also the only thing on the gun that legitimately feels like it's vulnerable. Right, I agree. So, you've done all that. We haven't even talked about the core feature that makes it the Abadie. The, Which is the actual yeah. gate loading system. Right. How do you feel about Abity gates? So I, I honestly don't. The concept in and of itself, I, I get it. Like it's supposed to be, I get it for cavalry. Like you're supposed to switch hands with it. So you pop open your gate, you switch hands and you load from there. And you're able to pull the trigger to, to help with rapidity of loading. Right. And I can see people getting fast with that. It's just. I, I, I know there's like there's gonna be faster systems like out there eventually in the war, but like so for me, it, it's it's a it's a flawed system right. in and of itself. You know but, what's coming, right? However, this one does feel really good, the and, and it's timed very well. Like I didn't really have any issues with it. The Abadie system to me feels like one that showed up a little too late. Yeah. If it had been invented 10, 20 years beforehand, mm -hmm. it would have been brilliant. Oh, we, yeah. I think we would have seen it in the Colt 1873. You know, mm -hmm. Like, it just, it would have been everywhere because it's such a minor thing to add that gives you a lot of impact in terms of using the gun. May I borrow that? Sure. If you think about it just from a safety perspective, when you're handling a revolver and you want to check it clear, you would normally, on a gate loader for a lot of these, open it up and just roll it to check all the cylinders, right? Right. Click, click, click. It's super fun, but it doesn't really roll, right? No, it, it definitely has some it's, pressure against it. It's very interesting to think that on this gun, if I want to check clear, all I have to do is open the gate. I know the hammer is disengaged. And, you and I can just pull this six times, and That's I've seen every fast. cylinder. Right, and then if I want to load, if I have a handful, I can get really quick at one, two, three, four, five, six, load. Mm -hmm. And on ejection, you can get really quick at kick, 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 kick. That's when it's running perfectly. And you see that snag, and that's what I want to talk about too. I want mm -hmm. to, before I forget, because I went right over it. Oh, yeah. Uh, this particular unit has some damage because it's not a perfect gun. When it came to us, it looks like it took a sharp blow right on sort of the mating surfaces for this component. Mm -hmm. And it was dented over and you literally could not get the ejector all the way back. So I had to very carefully fit a punch 
actually I had to get the diameter down on the punch so that I could get in there so I didn't mess up with the gun and drive it backwards to just sort of create the path again mm -hmm. without scratching the gun, without doing anything crazy. And it works. Yeah, I did manage to get it out of there, but because I didn't want to tear up the gun, I didn't sit there and hammer it completely out of the way. So there's still a snag because I didn't want to ruin the finish on the gun or anything like that. I just right. want to carefully, carefully push so it out of the way. So that it actually functioned. So we got it to barely where it needs to be without damaging it. Um, so just a caveat to why that seems a little stiff. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, it's still absolutely beautiful gun. I do absolutely love that. But we do need to get further into it, don't yeah, we? Yeah, so you haven't even shot it yet. We've now loaded no. the gun. Yep. She's loaded. Okay. We present, and I believe you started with single action fire first. Yep, definitely did. And... So I, I guess I need to say this twofold, or say this uh, one way, and then we'll talk about another way. <laughs> so, dry, like as is now, really, really incredibly, incredibly light hammer. The single uh, action pull through, very, very crisp, smooth, barely anything there. It's it's perfect. Now you have female hands, and and you've been made fun of for this on the show repeatedly for having to deal with. Say, Can the, confirm that is female. The Reich's revolver. Right? Like yes. you've really cursed some heavy hammers. Uh, so let's take a moment and savor. Have you handled a gun that is maybe even easier to cock than this one or no? I can't think of one in this state that was easier to cock. Right. The hammer is so light, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. in our high speed footage, I noticed that it was like being battered back. Yes. So like that's crazy. There's a there's a con there's, there's a counterpoint to that, which is that it would boom and bounce, but it is a light hammer to pull mm -hmm. back. And the trigger also pretty light. Like it's not it's not the lightest trigger I think I've handled. Well, hold on, single action. Sing well, okay, fine, single action. Very light. Very very light. But I was getting into double action. Right. Sorry, the double action still pretty light. It's not it's, like I said, it's not the lightest I've handled, We're but it's pretty pretty. We're not in Smith and Wesson M and P. It's light to moderate. No, we're not there. How about um, oh boy, we haven't covered one for the show. Uh, what about the Nagants, the old ones, not the gas seal Nagants, but the bigger ones? I think it's pretty close comparable to okay. that. Somewhere in the medium range. Yeah, so it's not bad. It's really not. I, I think it's my even pull through on that's pretty pretty steady. Okay. But for us, for shooting this, we had to kind of uh, you had to throw in a shim, right? Yes. So. May has just described all this dry. Yes. Which means no ammo. No. And to a certain degree, you got to experience this with ammo once. Right. But the we noticed an issue immediately <laughs> after firing. So we may even have some footage of us cursing this. I don't even remember if we do. We might. Um, I'll take a look and see if I can pull some up. We started filming this. This has been a journey to get this gun going mm -hmm. because we do not want to disrupt the gun, but no. the gun is not perfect. Right. So what it was doing is we would fire one round and then the gun would lock up. Just completely. You pull the trigger, no good. You and pull the hammer back, no good. For for a while there, I was hoping it was me because it, if it's human error, like that's way easier and simple to deal well, with. You would hand it to me and I would go boom, boom and be like, are you crazy? And the, by the way... We only had, the rounds are so difficult to make for this that we had like 20 rounds. Right. So we were trying not to do this. And then mm -hmm. we ended up blowing all of them trying to figure out what happened. Sent them back over to David, who does our hand loading. Thank yes. you, David. Yes, David did a good job. So David managed to get more rounds made. And then we would go out and test fire it again. And we were having all, so we took it apart. We thought maybe the hand was grinding on the inside of the frame. Um, we, like you, Bruno, and David would sit there with the I action open I used temporary sometimes. marker to mm -hmm. like mark it out and pull the trigger and there was no scraping. And I was like, okay, that's not it. So we were going down the line. And what it ended up being is I finally figured it out uh, on like the third test session. And by the way, at this point we fired seven rounds to the gun. Mm -hmm. It's just, there's Which, so few to If this with. gives you guys any of an insight into this, like sometimes this is just how this happens where we'll get a gun in and presumably everything's work. It looks like it should be perfect. Oh, this but... gun looks beautiful. Oh uh, yeah. On these Abadies, this one is in gorgeous condition. Mm -hmm. Literally the only thing unusual about it was there was uh, some denting in the track, like I said, mm -hmm. and I don't know what it is about the Abadies. The cylinder blue is a little more worn than the blue on the gun. And I've seen that on multiple Abadies. So I'm not sure if that's a thing. If anybody has another one out there to confirm, let me know. But the cylinder was a little softer than the blue on the rest of the gun. There was this one little dent inside the track. Mm -hmm. It should have been a perfect runner. And yet here we had this weird jam. And we're inside the gun. We're looking for nope. all these problems. We're literally firing, you know, load one round, fire it. Mm -hmm. 
and then hold the trigger because now we've the one round that's in the gun is out. Hold that all together. Get somebody else to help pop the plate, pop it open, and look at the parts alignment to be like, what is going on? Yep. Finally, I figured it out by sheer, I don't know what, Luck. some weird, no, just some weird inspiration. I felt I was loading it again or unloading it. And I felt a slight movement of the cylinder. What it was is that there's just enough forward and back play in that cylinder, and it's not much, but tiny, tiny little couple thou movement forward and back on the cylinder. When you fire it, it would drive the cylinder all the way forward. And then that allowed, that meant that the hand engaged it just the wrong angle. Mm -hmm. Now, you could fix that by retiming the hand. I'm not about to get into all that. So I actually took feeler gauge for like automotive purposes mm -hmm. and cut it into a shim to keep the cylinder back by a couple thou. The problem with that is that changed the pressure on the trigger because right. now it became a much heavier trigger because that it didn't have that... I think the solution, if, I, if we were just moving the cylinder, I think the cylinder needed to come back a very specific amount of thou, mm -hmm. and I did not have time or ammo to find that exact number, so I walked it back kind of to snug, and kind of snug meant that poor May had to deal with the heavier trigger. This is a long but, story. But after that, it did run. Right. Uh, it ran perfectly. It just ran a lot heavier. Mm -hmm. So I think when you're watching her kind of struggle with it just a bit, that's a little unfair to the revolver, I guess is what we're saying. Fair. Now... Getting into the recoil, I guess I was expecting more to it. <laughs> yeah, it's an old world revolver, so you're expecting that boom. I, yeah, I was really expecting a boom. I was expecting more of a rot to it. I guess I was, in general, just expecting so much more to come out of this guy. Because basically, I'm thinking, like, it, it's a lighter load, you know, than 9 millimeters. So, like, it, it, it it's like, wait. <laughs> it's 9.1 by 17, and the way Don't the numbers... do you think? It's like 38 Smith & Wesson? Vaguely. It, kind it is, of. That's the closest I can give you is 38 Smith & Wesson out of a 2-pound handgun. That's what I forgot. Yeah, it's 2-pound handgun. It's pretty muscle-heavy. So, I was like, after I shot it, I went, oh, I guess... I guess that is what I should have expected. From also, it. you had all this anxiety about it not running. God, so I'm sitting here thinking I'm expecting to have to pull through that trigger, and I'm expecting, and the trigger's heavier now. So I'm also on top of that, having a heavier trigger. I'm expecting it to jam. So I'm like, I just gotta pull through, even and hard. Like that's the way I gotta <laughs> do it. And then we just did the shoot, and I went, Oh, it just I mean, ran now. I think if you okay. can, I think if you watch, you can watch her anxiety coming down the more rounds come out of the gun. I was just like, oh, thank God it ran. I was like, thank God, we're done. I can go home and just be like, done. <laughs> and that's kind of sad because you have a very beautiful firearm yeah. that you now have a very tumultuous experience with. It's very anxiety yeah, inducing experience. Because it was the last time we had, or not the last time, but... It, it, we were pinched for time at this point. This is going to be presumably the last shoot we could have had to have confirmed we can, yes, do the episode when it's supposed to be airing, which is next week now. That's right. crazy. Yeah, we are filming in the nick of time again because of various... You can never predict old guns. No, you and really can't. We have a severe discipline in terms of safety for ourselves and for the pieces. Yes. So we can't really just wrench on them to get them running because no. we're taking care of other people's babies. And to be fair, that's happened before where uh, the Burdan 2, that's a perfectly good recent example where we had a Burdan 2, we had the ammo. The it's, problem was is that the first one we had just did not run. It's been a lot of those back to back. <laughs> like, yeah, like and, so, and then the thing was we were able to get another one in, but you'd already partially written the script. Like you've done no. a bunch of your notes. Well, let's talk about the Abity. I think you're venting. Just I'm, I'm having, I'm having an, a moment. If you'd like to support the show... <laughs> And May's sanity, uh, visit the cnrsl.com site to find the shop or a link to Patreon oh. or to whatever service is available to us at the time you're watching this in the distant future. Hi, her, feature me. Her anxiety aside, uh -huh. let's get an assessment of the Abity. Okay, that, no, 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 that's fair. Um, so we'll discount the heavy trigger pull because there's some wear on this gun. Right, so I need to anticipate the, the lighter, sm just as smooth trigger pull mm. that is current. So let's summarize this a little bit easier, okay? Delicate looking, mm -hmm. delicate feeling, excellent ergonomics for grip and pointing. Mm -hmm. How oh. are the sights? You However, have yeah, that's what I was about to say. With pointing, that is the one thing that I think is not quite as nice because the thing is, it's a very deep set V notch back here. So I'm looking at it and being like, oh, I'm jazzed about that. I see that deep V notch. That's going to be great. And then I lined up with the front and it's like, oh, wait, I'm lining up an inverted triangle inside a triangle. It's like, mm. where, where do I... I mean, it, it, you can pu you can put it in there, but it's like it doesn't. 
It's not quite perfect, I think, on the vertical. Can we be fair to its time period? Oh, yeah. Above or below average for the time? Above average for its time. So not great because it's not modern, but I would call it above average for the time, especially for a revolver. Um, Especially for 1878 to 1886 is the range that this was released. True. Yeah, I'll give it good points. Um, Okay, so decent sights for the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, Great ergonomics. Mm -hmm. Uh, Gate loader. But Abity, so but it's the Abity, best so possible, it's the best gate, possible loader. gate loader that it could possibly be. You are correct. And mm. it is actually a pretty smooth gate loader on top of that, too. Right. Smooth trigger, smooth hammer, very easy to operate. Yep. Reliable, once we did the little fix, which mm-hmm. presumably they would have been reliable. And then the I at least have an ejector rod on the gun. You do have an ejector rod. On the gun. But it's scary delicate. It is scary delicate. Okay, so that's the first hit. I guess yeah. where gate loader is a hit. Don't take any damage in the channel path either, otherwise you don't get to use it. Okay, gate loader is a hit. Ejector rod's kind of a hit. Mm-hmm. Cartridge very weak. It is a very weak cartridge. I agree. But very smooth. Follow up shots are easy. Follow up shots are easy with it. Yeah. Do I it's wish a, it were heavier? It's probably mm-hmm. a little better than. It 30. can stand to be a little more powerful. Do you trust that cartridge more than thirty-two ACP? Uh, yeah, I trust it more than thirty-two. I'd give it a bonus. I'd yeah. give it a bonus. I mean, over, it would be it's over, a nine it's millimeter cartridge. Over thirty-two, yeah. Yeah, it's a thirty-eight Smith and Wesson. Okay. <laughs> You're really not into the cartridge. I'm just it, okay. it's, it, I, it could handle more, is what I'm thinking. What we're building up to is: Does this pass the May test for a serviceable firearm? Would you? acceptably taken in the battle. I'm not saying you're thrilled, Mm -hmm. but is it like I would put it to the side and steal the first thing off a dead guy or, okay, it goes in my holster, I use it? So I think this would get a soft yes. And for me, it's because... Honestly, it being a gate, I'm getting into the gate loader bit. Like it's like at the top end of the gate loaders. You are correct. I like that. I like what you said about that. It right. really is because with the Abity system, it's at the top end of the gate loaders. Right. And the cartridge is not bad. It's just not as powerful as it could be. So it's, it's still it's still okay. It's better than 32. So I'll mm-hmm. give it that. And then overall, I was able to run it, and you can get pretty. You can line up your shots pretty quickly with it, and the trigger is really nice. The hammer is pretty simple. Yeah, so I, I think it has to get a soft yes in my book, okay. personally. Soft yes. Yeah. Moderate yes? Soft. I okay. said soft. Okay, hey, I'm just trying to What's advocate moderate? for the Abbey. Moderate's not soft. Well, you have a very unusual scale that is very subjective, let's be honest. To be fair, I, I try my hardest not to also put my own uh, personal opinion into it as right. much as possible. Especially, like, I'm trying to think of this one, you know, minus the shim. I'm trying to make sure I think of it as I'm handling it now. You know, without the shim in there. So I've got an ni- even nicer trigger and hammer pull than what I did when actually shooting this gun when it ran. I have a hard time considering where to put this revolver for the war. Really? Because if you think about it, we've handled the 9.4 millimeter Nagants that had a much hardier cartridge. Yes. But the guns themselves are way more massive. Mm-hmm. But they do feel really nice. Mm-hmm. So the question is... How often, don't forget how few rounds of ammunition they ultimately issued people, like officers, for carrying this kind of stuff around. Yeah. Your handgun really wasn't used very often unless we're talking about, like, trench raiding, at which point semi-autos are deeply preferred. Yeah, absolutely. So if it's a personal defense weapon, as it was thought of when it was adopted, I don't, other than the cartridge being a little anemic, I don't have many problems with it because you're supposed to dump six and then after that you got bigger problems. You know, reload wasn't really that hot of a consideration. Well, to be fair, uh, if you're having to pull this out of anything to dump your six, you're still afraid that this little In a hurry, I'm snapping that thing off. Just being like, oh crap, crap. pop. Oh, you gotta be kidding me. (laughs) Right? So, I'm not... It's not, it's not, I'm not jazz, but I'm certainly more positive than I am with other guns because a comparable gun to this one from the time period is going to be, and it's going to be, uh, the earliest version I think is 1887, so the next year you'd see the Swedish adoption of the Naga pistol scaled down mm-hmm. for a 7.5 millimeter cartridge that I actually haven't done the research on yet, so forgive me guys. But this would be the export Nagant. So these are the ones that are just like the Russian 1895 gas seal. Okay. But they don't have the gas seal. So they have good triggers, single that and double action. Nice, actually. And a 7.5 millimeter cartridge, mm-hmm. which is not as big, but might have more power. I haven't researched that cartridge. Mm-hmm. So this is very comparable to that, but those don't even have the Abity system necessarily. Right. So 
Hmm. You know. Yeah. yeah it, it's it. It's still got the potential to be even better than the ones that came after. You're right. Yeah. In its time period of adoption, I think it was perfectly fine. I think the problem is it suffers from the fact that there are great advancements right around the corner, mm -hmm. which mostly have to do with rapid loading, and then immediately after that. Revolvers really kind of become obsoleted by semi-automatic semi pistols. pistols yeah. However, that does take until about right at the start of the war, though. Like, you're really not seeing good semi-automatic pistols until 1910. And it is crazy you think that some of these pistol, some of these revolvers even went into serve into World War II. Uh, yeah, a lot of those period revolvers. Yeah. Not so much this, I mean, no, he was not around. This one, but... but yeah. It's it, crazy to think about. Yeah, a lot of them lasted, well, they were built to last forever, mm -hmm. so it lasted forever. Wasn't built to reload very quickly. So uh, I think that's the Abity, right? Yeah, that's pretty much the Abity I think in it's a, a nutshell. I think it's just like sort of the brilliant last flash of trying to save the gate loader. You know what I mean? Like it's mm -hmm. the last improvement to the gate loader. And again, I want to reiterate, if that development had come 15 years sooner, God, it, can it would you have imagine? been everything. Like, it, I wonder if development of revolvers would have evolved differently. It's also interesting for, it's really interesting to see how rapidly things advance. Like, because mm -hmm. we're talking about this gun being displaced in its market between, the first one was adopted 78, mm -hmm. the next one's 86. And in that time period already, it's fallen behind a lot of ideas. But not only that, when you think of 78, you know, the, the single action army is a 73. Mm-hmm. It's a single action gate loader. You know what I mean? Like, but, but everybody's obsessed with the cartridge, which right. is 45, because you know, in the US it was knock them down. So that's the sort of wild changes and decisions that a lot of armies are making in that period. It's probably the most exciting period for handgun technology, I think. Yeah. So there is like rapid changes in development. It's crazy. Yeah. And again, uh, Michael, thank you for trusting us with yes, this piece. Yes, thank you, Michael. Um, we appreciate it's it. It's absolutely gorgeous. And it's one I wanted to cover for a while just because of how it's sort of sitting on that sort of that, that vertex of technological change. Mm -hmm. But thank you all for joining us. I hope you learned a lot on this one because most people didn't know this gun existed. Yeah. Uh, and, and I hope more information surfaces because I know that that was something you're hoping oh, for in yeah. the future. There's huge gaps in this episode. I'm quite happy to find out we were wrong about something on this one because we are really by the seat of our pants on this one. Mm -hmm. uh, which, by the way, I'm always happy to be updated on these things. I actually have received a number of emails where people are like, oh, you didn't even bother. And they're very angry. And I'm just like, oh, thank you, because I don't pretend. Because now you have more information. I, I'm a knowledge consolidator. You know, I haven't poured my heart and soul in, in five years of my life into researching this gun. Mm -hmm. I, I poured two weeks into this gun, and then I got to go to the next one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I try very hard to give you guys the best information that I can glean from what's available. And I'd compile it as much as possible. Right, but I'm an aggregator. And when you tell me there's other information that could be aggregated, I'm just happy to have that so I can re-aggregate it. Yep. Like, that's that's just what we do. Um, so whenever you, by the way, whenever you are curious about a gun, find and buy the books that are done by the actual researchers because they need support probably more than we do. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, have a good one, and we'll see you guys next time. Night, everybody. All right, gang, a lot of you have told me how stressful life can be, especially lately. So I would like to remind you that we do have the Hand Trap series. And I know that maybe half of you are actually watching this. And I understand it started very dry. However, if you would like to simulate spending time outdoors with your friends through the warm glow of your computer screen, this is your best bet. Now, of course, if this seems far too cheerful, well, don't worry. May and I went on a slight rant against the IRS during our Behind the Scenes podcast this past week. So uh, if you're a patron, make sure you check that out. Have a good one.